start. Good evening. I'm Julia Wrigley, the Interim Provost of the Graduate Center. It is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We are nearing the end of a semester of extraordinary public programs at the Graduate Center. We like to say that we put you at the center of the discussion of the most timely issues of the day. This spring, for example, we focused on subjects from inequality to immigration to biodiversity. Public programs are vital to our mission as a public institution of advanced research and learning in New York City. The program tonight is part of the Graduate Center's two-year initiative called The Promise and Perils of Democracy. We are examining the state of democracy here and around the world, what democracy looks like now and where it may be in the future. I want to acknowledge the Carnegie Corporation of New York for its ongoing support of this important project. We started this spring by looking at the definition of democracy through the bedrock institutions that make it work. Earlier this semester, we heard from a renowned panel of journalists about the role of the free press. Two weeks ago, noted political analyst Fareed Zakaria offered his perspective on the health of democracies around the world. He observed that the healthiest democracies have the sturdiest judiciaries. Tonight, we focus on our country's judiciary, our third branch of government. When we talk about putting you in the center of the conversation, tonight's speakers bring essential firsthand experience to understanding the role of the judiciary in democracy. Judge Robert Katzman is the chief judge of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In addition to a law degree, he has a PhD in government from Harvard and has recently published a book called Judging Statutes. Before joining the bench, he was a professor of law and public policy at Georgetown University. He has been active in promoting access to justice, especially for immigrants, and sparked the creation of the Immigrant Justice Corps to meet the need for high quality legal assistance for immigrants. <laughs> Nice to see the enthusiasm. <laughs> judge Jenny Rivera is associate judge of the New York Court of Appeals, the highest court for the state of New York. She was previously professor of law at the CUNY School of Law, where she founded the Center on Latino and Latina Rights and Equality. She clerked for now Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor when Sotomayor was on the federal district court in the Southern District of New York. Before becoming a professor at CUNY and joining the bench, she had a distinguished career as a public interest and government attorney. The Honorable Shira Shenlin served as a federal judge of the US District Court for the Southern District of New York for 22 years. She retired from the bench in 2016. Before joining the bench, she worked as a prosecutor and commercial lawyer and is currently an arbitrator. Her rulings in a sex discrimination law lawsuit shaped the field of electronic discovery and civil litigation. In 2013, and I think many of you will know this, she issued a 195 page decision holding that the New York Police Department's stop and frisk practices were unconstitutional. Our moderator for tonight's discussion is Dean for Master's Programs and Professor of Sociology here at the Graduate Center, Julie Sook. Before coming to the Graduate Center, Dean Sook was a law professor at the Cardoza Law School of Yeshiva University and has taught as a visiting professor at Harvard, Columbia, the University of Chicago, and UCLA. She is a leading scholar of comparative law and society with a focus on discrimination and inequality, and also on women, work, and family. Please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, 
to Interim Provost Julia Wrigley. I'm thrilled to be here this evening. I recently joined the Graduate Center, and I'm very excited to welcome uh, three distinguished judges uh, for our program this evening on the judiciary. Uh, we're going to begin uh, where some of our conversations left off uh, about democracy, uh, because one theme in this series has been whether or not democracy is in crisis. So I thought we could begin by asking uh, the judges to comment uh, on this idea of uh, democracy being in crisis in the United States today, uh, and perhaps identifying what the greatest threats are uh, to democracy in the world we now inhabit. So perhaps we could start with you, uh, Judge Katzman. Uh, first, it's, uh, it's great to be here and um, I think in terms of um, uh, threats to a democracy, I think uh, one threat to democracy is um, political apathy and the uh, very low voter turnout uh, is, is, is a concern because uh, uh, you need an active and engaged uh, citizenry, otherwise, uh, a concern that I think that um, we should all have is that uh, you have uh, elections in which such a small percentage of people vote that it's, it's, it's hard to know whether uh, the voters are representative of, uh, of our polity. And I think that that is a, uh, uh, that is a concern. Uh, I think another um, threat to democracy is uh, an erosion of trust uh, in our institutions. And to the extent that there is a lack of trust uh, in our institutions, uh, that bodes ill for uh, the democracy. And uh, related to, to, to all that is uh, just a lack of knowledge uh, among, among our uh, citizens and non-citizens, actually non-citizens know more about our democracy than anyone else, as statistics uh, show. But uh, the, uh, 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 most Americans, unfortunately, have a very dim understanding of our system of government. Um, only a third of uh, our citizens can identify a single First Amendment right. And that should be a concern. 10% um, of our, uh, uh, of college graduates, and this is of course not true of any graduate of, uh, of CUNY, <laughs> but 10% of college graduates think that uh, Judge Judy is a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> not that, I don't mean to suggest that she is a threat to democracy, <laughs> I'm saying that when we don't know about uh, how our system works and who's in, in, in running things, then that's, that's a concern. Shinlin. Well, I thought about this question too, and I have a different list, but that just shows how many threats there might be out there. So, so the first threat to me is the attacks on the press. This, this notion of being the enemy of the people is very, very uh, frightening to me because it's the press that does the very educating that you were talking about. We, we count on the press to investigate and report and teach in its way. So without, without an, a, a press that's free to do that and unintimidated, our democracy um, is at risk. Uh, another th uh, threat, I think, to our democracy is the delegitimization of the judiciary. We have had so many attacks on judges directly. We've had the phrase so-called judges. We've had judges identified as Bush judges or Obama judges or Trump judges. That's not the way it is and that's not the way it should be. Whenever there's an adverse decision, somebody comes out and says, that's because that judge uh, thought that he or she knew what to do, but they didn't know what to do. So this, this delegitimization of the third branch of government is very troubling to me. The third threat to me is what I would call voter suppression. Now that picks up a little bit. I don't think you meant suppression, but I'm worried about voter suppression. Laws and rules that are passed 
that prevent people from voting is the last thing we want to do. We want to encourage voting. We want it to become easier and easier, not harder and harder. And I'm very concerned that voter suppression is a threat to our democracy. And the last one, because we all have to be pretty quick here, there's so much to cover, is I'm worried about our concept of checks and balances, which is our history as a democracy. We don't seem to have three co-equal branches at the moment. The executive branch is very muscular and thinks that it, in some way, should control the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And of course, that's not the way we're structured. So we need to have three co-equal branches because that's what has made our democracy unique and successful. Judge Rivera. I haven't left me much. Those are both really great lists. <laughs> but, but I have a couple of things to add. Um, so I, I think I had at the top of my list the threat of violence. I really see this increase in hate crimes, this uh, emboldened sense of uh, resolving any disagreements through violence as troubling. It puts fear into not only individuals, but actual discrete communities who then won't go and vote or are afraid to, to have their voices heard. So I'm deeply, deeply concerned about uh, the, the uh, increase in violence and the way that it is being viewed as an appropriate response to what people disagree with or what people see as troubling. Uh, as well, of course, as targeting uh, individuals from uh, vulnerable communities as the source of all ails for the United States of America. Uh, once having been seen as the strength of various immigrant communities, we are now told that uh, immigrants are terrible they are what cause all our problems. They are bringing down our economy. Uh, uh, the United States is closed. Uh, and New York is not closed, by the way. Uh, but that, that's the message that's sent. And I find this all uh, deeply troubling and, and definitely undermines uh, our democracy. And along the lines of what's already been said, that independence of the judiciary, but I, I to me, it's that also suggesting that this branch, the judiciary, should conduct itself in the same way that the other two branches do. You know, the politics of the winner-take-all mentality, that that's the way we decide decisions. It's just whatever the majority rule is, whatever, whoever, whatever party was the one that successfully uh, uh, pushed through your appointment or helped you in your election, that's the party you're loyal to, not the rule of law not the rule of law, but the politics, that somehow our uh, particular branch should function in that way. I find uh, deeply troubling, I think this is tied to what's already been mentioned about um, the lack of understanding and education about the way our government proceeds, about what are the strengths of our democracy, tied again into what's already been mentioned about the attacks on the media and the distrust of the media and what, what could ever be truth. There are some facts. I know people tell us there are no such things as facts, but there really are facts, and judges of all people understand that there really are facts. Uh, you may not like them, you may wish they were otherwise, but there are some things that truly are, are facts. So those are the kinds of things that I would add to this terrific list that uh, my co-panelists today have come up with. Great, thank you. So this brings us to how might we might think of these threats in relation to the judicial role. And we can begin by asking, what are the core features of judicial independence? What, do we, what are we talking about when we say that the judiciary has to remain independent in the context of these threats? Sometimes judges can be described as protectors of dem democratic institutions and the democratic process. Uh, and I wondered if you had some thoughts about how we should understand judicial independence. We could actually, yeah, go back to Judge Katzman. I think judicial independence has uh, at least two components to it. Um, one is decisional independence, and the other is institutional uh, independence, institutional autonomy. Decisional independence um, refers to uh, what judges should be able to do, and that is to render decisions according to the law as they see it without fear of retribution. In other words, the ability to call it as they see it, grounded in, in, in the law. 
uh, and uh, without fear of, 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 of political uh, blowback. So I think that that's a very important part of, uh, of decisional uh, independence. Uh, the other part of uh, judicial independence is uh, autonomy as an institution. In other words, having the resources that are necessary for the branch of government, the judiciary, to do its job. And um, that means having adequate budgets, adequate appropriations, adequate uh, security, um, ensuring that the courthouses are uh, welcoming places and places that are open for uh, business. Uh, we saw in, 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 uh, in recent months when there was a threat of a government shutdown affecting the judiciary, uh, that would have meant uh, closing jury trials, shutting down jury trials, um, uh, our employees not having salaries, all of which would have had a corrosive effect on the institutional uh, independence. So I think those are the two components that I would focus on when I think about independence. If we're allowed to go in the same order twice. Of course. Um, I, I, again, I had, I, those thoughts are exactly right, and I have a couple more that I would add to that. First of all, in the federal judiciary, we are extremely lucky because we have life tenure. And you need to think about that. We can't be fired. And you go around the world, and you will see judges fired in other country, countries, literally fired, sometimes jailed. And if we look historically, when dictators took over, they basically got rid of the judges. That's the first thing they did. So an independent judiciary is one that is in place and safe. Now, as I know Judge Rivera will talk about, the state courts are different. In some states, judges are elected, and in some, they're appointed. But in many, even when they're appointed, there are recall elections. So judges have to run for office in many states. They have to run for retention. When that happens, you have to look at the funding. Judges are attacked, and there are millions of dollars of what's called dark money that get involved in those elections. And many judges have been turned out of office because of decisions they have made, sometimes very brave decisions. But whole courts, whole state courts, have been wiped out in retention elections. So we need to think about that. And the third thing that I would say about uh, the, the independence of the judiciary is the selection process. I'm concerned about the selection process. It has become very, very politicized. And I think you kind of alluded to that, that the parties uh, sort of strive to appoint judges that they believe will carry out their agenda. And with that in mind, you really no longer have an independent judiciary that's committed to the rule of law. If you feel beholden to that appointer to carry out his or her agenda, that's not a good thing. So those are just a few short points I wanted to add. Yeah. I, I agree with <clears throat> all that has been said. Uh, and I think they're excellent points. I don't know that I can add much more. But I will say this, and, and it is true that in the state system, uh, to the extent we don't have life tenure, that uh, although some people get reelected through the electoral process may feel like they have life tenure, but we do have a maximum age limit. Um, and so uh, certainly uh, judges don't really get to decide when they want to leave in that sense. Um, so yes, that life tenure makes a difference. Uh, I would say that uh, along the lines of what was mentioned regarding the budget and having enough resources to be able to do your job so that as long as politicians have that power of the purse that they attempt to use to control uh, the judiciary, that that is very troubling. Uh, but salaries are not a small thing. You know, the state judges went a very, very long time without a salary increase. And I know that uh, it's very easy to say, you know, judges are already well paid. People are hungry, they're starving, but the reality is that you have to, you can't, I'll just put it this way, you can't do democracy on the cheap. You really have to pay enough to ensure that people feel there's quality in their lives and they're able to do their jobs. And so uh, it, it's really important that uh, the numbers uh, are supportive of the judiciary. And I will say again, uh, pointing out 
any kind of effort to make our general public believe that this branch of government should function as politicized as the other branches function, it undermines our democracy. It ensures that you don't have an independent judiciary, no matter how much judges strive on the other side. There will always be these kinds of push-pull situations, the demands to hire a particular person as your clerk, the particular person uh, to be in your chambers, that you want a particular project, as has already been mentioned. You expect a particular outcome, right? To be in an interview process and to be asked, what would you decide on that issue? What would be your holding on that issue? Are you pro this or anti that? Those kinds of questions, I think, uh, really uh, fail to understand the way that the judiciary, or, and judges, of course, all of us individually, see our role as not to necessarily make sure any political agenda is uh, indeed um, uh, protected, furthered, but to apply the rule of law, as has already been mentioned, call it as we see it, with the support of legal doctrine and analysis behind your decision. Do you think there are institutional mechanisms that can be improved uh, to uh, promote the independence of the judiciary and to struggle against the politicization that we're now seeing? I really do think that the budget is a very big issue. I really think it's sort of an independent budget that, that is not subject to the political clamor is really critical. Whether or not that we can ever achieve that goal is a different story. Certainly the protection that the salary cannot drop is significant and uh, that constitutional protection is, is, is very important to us. Um, other mechanisms to protect the judiciary. I'm not going to get into the debate about elections versus um, appointment, but to the extent that it has already been mentioned, you, elections are not only about the initial selection, but recalling someone based on what that judge thinks is the right call in a case. That, of course, that mechanism, I think, is very troubling. Another institutional mechanism that comes to my mind is the need for courts to have what's called a public information officer, a PIO. Why is that important? Because people don't fully understand what goes on in court, what the rulings are made of, why their rulings are made the way they are. The judges try to explain, but they can't speak directly uh, with media, for example. But a public information officer can help the media to understand the case, and that's very important. The PIO can direct them to the documents, to the record, to uh, defining terms, can help them out so that the media then can translate it to the public. So I think more interaction between the court uh, and the public through a public information officer would be a great help. Great, so, yeah. I think one, institutional mechanism, which is more of a, um, a political culture mechanism, is that um, to the extent that judges are confirmed uh, in a nonpartisan way, that only reinforces the, the sense that there are no Obama judges, there are no Bush judges, there are no Trump judges. To the extent that um, it becomes routine that every judge is is voted on in a partisan uh, on partisan terms. Then that will ultimately, I worry, undermine the the judiciary. And um, it used to be not that long ago where um, all of us were confirmed by substantial majority votes, and that was healthy for the system because nobody could say, "Oh, that judge is is a Republican." judge or a democratic judge, but that perception will change if we continue to have these, oh, I, these I votes. I say it may have changed. You know, I'm the only one of the three of us who's not on the bench, so I have First Amendment rights. They, they, they don't. They have to be very, very careful as to what they say, but I don't have any such constraints. So I can tell you, I can tell you that if you look at the first hundred appointments to the federal judiciary of the, of the current administration, they came out of committee overwhelmingly on 12 to 10 votes in the Senate, which means 
The 12 Republicans voted yes, the 10 Democrats voted no. The percentage of 12 tens are extremely high. And Judge Katzman is entirely right that in the past, we all went through with a full committee vote. We then were passed by the full Senate on a voice vote. Now you see that vote being 52-48. So it's very, very partisan, and we're talking now solely about the federal side. I'm not commenting on the state side at all, but that's, that's the truth on the federal side at the moment. Well, it seems like what I'm hearing is that there is also um, w one thing that can happen uh, as a result of the politicization of judicial appointments is that then there's a, a perception of judges as political actors. Uh, and inevitably, there are many decisions issued by courts, uh, which even if not intended to be such, the public then politicizes and reads um, as uh, a political act. And I was just wondering um, how judges can think through those partisan times. That is, if there are rulings that can be perceived to be partisan, um, whether that changes uh, or should influence the way that a judge um, thinks about their cases. Who wants uh, to start? Yeah. Should we start with the one who has? Got the first I've got the First Amendment rights, yeah. yes. So, so of, cor of course a judge is aware of the uh, effect of the public's perception uh, of the rulings that they're going to make. But the judge has to struggle not to take that into consideration. The judge knows that there's going to be a reaction. Some questions are sort of uh, very contentious, and they have great impact on the public. But you still have to say, I have to follow the rule of law. I have to do what's right, even though I know that there will be sort of blowback uh, by the public. And what worries me sometimes is that there's so much room for misunderstanding the judicial decision. So I try to think of some examples on that to, to give you, make it tangible. So one that always came to my mind, and I was a trial judge, was releasing people on bail. You know, it's a, a, typically in the state court, Somebody comes in and makes the bail decision, somebody's released, and every once in a long while, the person released then kills somebody or hurts somebody, and the judge is immediately tapped. How could you let that person out? Look, he killed his spouse or partner, whatever it is. Well, the answer is if you understood the considerations that go into making a bail decision, the judge probably made the right call, and the judge is not responsible for what then happened but every judge is concerned about that type of thing. The same thing with sentencing. And again, I, I imposed over 2,000 sentences. So sometimes you give a sentence that's low and that the public doesn't understand. They say, how could you give only 18 months to this person? Well, again, if you understood how the sentencing system works and the considerations that a judge takes into account, you might understand that. So you, it has to be explained what a judge does, what a judge takes into account in making decisions. And that's not always known by the public. So that's a brief answer. Okay. Well, the crisis of democracy is sometimes described as a crisis of inequality. Of course, here at the Graduate Center, we have many scholars of inequality and a center that studies uh, the rise of socioeconomic inequality. Uh, and I wanted to turn our attention now to the role of judges in the context of inequality, particularly uh, the way in which inequality affects access to legal representation and access to justice. Uh, we talked earlier uh, about courts as institutions, and we might even think of judges as institution builders uh, and uh, initiators of in institutional changes uh, towards social justice, uh, particularly when it comes to access to justice and access to courts. And I was wondering, uh, perhaps we could start with Judge Katzman again, uh, particularly in light of your experience of working towards access to justice for immigrants, uh, what the judicial role is in these institution building efforts. So just uh, quickly by way of context, when I became a federal judge in 1999, the uh, number, percentage of immigration cases in our court would just about three, three percent. Uh, that meant that I would see only a handful of cases every now and then. But then, um, in the years after 9-11, uh, when there was uh, understandable concern about who was here legally, who was here not uh, legally, the uh, caseload of the Second Circuit uh, in immigration cases ballooned 
to uh, a point where uh, in 2005, 2006, 40% of our docket consisted of immigration cases. In, no, in other words, <clears throat> the docket uh, uh, just about doubled because of immigration cases. And when you see lots of cases, you, you begin to notice a pattern. And what I noticed was that um, the cases were uh, almost uniformly, although there were always exceptions, poorly argued that the uh, quality of legal representation was, uh, was abysmal. Uh, and this really bothered me because um, I had the sense if only there had been a, a good lawyer at the very outset of the case that the, the outcome could have been different. The problem is that by the time a case gets to the Court of Appeals, because uh, generally speaking, we are pretty much constrained once findings or fa of facts are made, that if the record is not developed at the very outset of the case, the uh, uh, chances for the, uh, the, the non-citizen of prevailing are very, very low. And this really very, this, this troubled me. And so to make a long story short, I, I uh, uh, started uh, with some great people, uh, the study group on immigrant representation, which uh, brought together all the stake stakeholders, the, uh, those in the federal government, uh, in the Department of Homeland Security, in the Department of Justice, the uh, immigration authorities, the uh, nonprofit uh, clinics, uh, law firms, um, state and local government, with the idea of trying to find ways to uh, improve the quality of representation for uh, immigrants. And um, what I learned uh, very early on was that the problem was much worse than I had uh, even known, because I was seeing at least cases where there were lawyers. And the problem is that fundamentally, and Judge Shinlin has been working on this in, in, from the private sector. Uh, the problem more fundamentally is the, the uh, absence of lawyers at the very outset of the case. And so we never even see those cases because they're never, they never get to be appealed. And the statistics are uh, dramatic. 63% uh, of, uh, of non-citizens in uh, uh, deportation proceedings do not have a a lawyer. And the difference between having a lawyer and not having a lawyer is, uh, is stark. So uh, if you have a, a lawyer in a, uh, uh, in a deportation proceeding uh, in the New York area, you are going to prevail something like 25%. If you don't have a lawyer, it's, uh, it's 3%. If you have a lawyer in an asylum, if you don't have a lawyer in an asylum case, you're only going to prevail 13% of the time. If you have a lawyer from the Immigrant Justice Corps, you're going to prevail 93% of the time, which shows you the difference between what having a, a lawyer is and not having a lawyer. So where I come at it as a, uh, a, as a judge um, is that um, I have a responsibility in terms of the fair and effective administration of justice to uh, try to ensure that there is access to justice so that justice uh, can be done. And it shouldn't be that uh, justice depends upon the, the uh, income level of somebody, whether he or she can afford to, um, to pay for a lawyer. And so, um, my role as a judge is, is to, I think, is to try to institutionally promote this. And um, I'm always very careful uh, not to talk about specific cases, but to talk about the uh, institutional uh, issues. And, um, and so um, uh, I've worked to two, two really basic initiatives. One is the Immigrant Justice Corps, which provides uh, uh, young lawyers a, a chance to get fellowships, to be trained, and to devote themselves full-time, their careers, to immigration law. Um, and the other was uh, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, which, 
was a product of the study group on immigrant representation. Lots of terrific people were involved in that. Um, to basically provide a model which other jurisdictions uh, could emulate, and that is the idea of representation paid for by the government uh, in, uh, in immigration cases. And uh, New York doesn't have it totally as, as New York City, um, but much, much, uh, much greater than uh, any other jurisdiction in the, in the country. I want to add, because he can't say this, but you've heard of the campaign called Be a Hero. This was really a hero in doing this work of getting New York to be number one in the country, leading the way of getting representation for people uh, caught up in the immigration system that couldn't get lawyers. So, you know, it's really a wonderful thing. Um, I also want to add that it's not just immigrants that we have to deal with who don't have counsel. It's little known that in our court, the Southern District of New York, which is a major commercial court, 25% of the trial court docket where I sat is pro se litigants. Pro se means for yourself. They have no lawyer. So people come into court, plain people who have a case, and they try to articulate their own case. Often they're prisoners who are complaining about prison conditions or something very bad that happened to them in, in prison. And how do, they, how do they bring their own case when they're up against a lawyer for the state or the city defending that case? So our court has also tried to help find counsel for pro se's who are prisoners, who are in employment cases, who are in disability rights cases, and help them by getting counsel. So it's not just immigrants, it's a lot of people who need access to justice, and that means a lawyer. You know, at the state level, um, I would say there's really th three ways that we've tried to deal with what is a, a real problem of access to justice, uh, inequality, um, and certainly the marginalization of various communities. So one is getting more money to institutional providers who can bring their resources, their training, and lawyers to bear to, to assist people who can't afford uh, uh, a lawyer. It's providing information to people who come into the court, uh, whether that's by just having an information area where they can ask people uh, some questions or whether we have it up on a computer that they can access themselves, whatever point of entry we can create for them, or uh, helping to train navigators who are non-lawyers there to assist someone who come in pro se. Uh, and then the last one is to try and bring more lawyers. I mean, it's tied to the first two things, but try to really bring more lawyers into the fold to really appreciate how important it is to do pro bono work to put in a lot of hours to support the organizations, whether it's through money or your volunteerism, uh, that are providing these services to low-income communities and marginalized communities. And some of that we've done through the 50-hour pro bono rule that requires everyone who's admitted into New York to have given at least 50 hours of pro bono services. Uh, and that, you know, the prior chief judge always felt that this was a helping profession it's in our DNA, these are his words, it's in our DNA, uh, and when people go to law school, they have to understand this is part of their obligation to be licensed in the state of New York, to not only give these 50 hours, but to have a, a, a different kind of mindset that what we do is give and we assist. We get great benefits from this license and the work that we do, real professional satisfaction from uh, being a lawyer, but it also means that we can't turn a blind eye to the fact that there are people in desperate need of legal assistance who simply can't f afford a lawyer, and as has already been mentioned, that might be the one thing that makes a difference. It's not about the merits of the case. It may very well be about not having someone there who can really give voice to your issues. Well, one thing you said that I find very interesting is that you've also worked with non-lawyers and I wondered what um, the realistic prospects are, because one of the problems, of course, is the rising cost of legal education uh, and the cost of legal representation. And in some states, um, 
scholars and even judges are exploring the prospects of training non-lawyers to provide support to pro se litigants and to perform other functions that perhaps in the past lawyers might have performed. And I was wondering if you had a comment or a thought about whether or not that's a realistic solution to the justice gap. Well, you know, it, it, it's a response uh, to a problem. Uh, it, I don't think it is a solution. Uh, I think the solution is to end income inequality. Uh, racism, uh, you know, treating people differently just because of the fact they can roll the R when they pronounce their last name. So. Uh, no, I don't think it's a solution in that way uh, that it's, it's going to take care of all the problems. But in many ways, uh, we have to respond to what we see. Right? We, we can't allow people to, to come in or not come in uh, because they don't have access to affordable uh, legal assistance. Uh, but I, I just want to say this. It, it is an important response, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that we cannot be about the business. It is not justice to say that someone who simply can't afford a lawyer should only have access to something that's anything less than high quality legal assistance. So if that can be provided in an appropriate case by someone who is not licensed as a lawyer, but otherwise under the law is able to provide a particular type of assistance, that's fine, but we shouldn't think that it's okay just because someone can't afford a lawyer to be given something less than high quality legal assistance. In, in the immigration uh, context, for example, there are uh, what are known as accredited representatives, uh, and these are um, uh, paralegals types who are trained to help with things like input, screening, uh, and that's, that's very useful. Um, and I think more can be done along those lines. At the same time, uh, we have to be clear that uh, there's some things that are very complicated where you need a lawyer and, and you can't substitute someone else f uh, for a lawyer, but more can be done. There was very good, um, I don't know if it's ever been published, but there was a very good um, speech given by uh, Jed Rakoff uh, about uh, a year ago on the uh, use of, um, of uh, non-lawyers in the uh, legal system. And um, um, if it's published somewhere, everyone should read it because I think it's very, very useful. I was going to say something along those lines that in medicine we now have physician's assistants who can do so much and save the time of the doctor for the, for the tasks that the PA shouldn't be doing. The same could very well be true in the legal area. There are many things a paralegal could do to help get the case ready so that the volunteer lawyer's time is saved and is able to be used and spread around for more clients. So I think the legal profession has to think outside the box and say, what tasks can the paralegal fairly do? For example, in immigration, you have to get a lot of documents. You often have to get them from abroad. It takes an enormous effort to collect those affidavits and documents, but you don't need to be a lawyer to do that. You need to be intelligent, educated, smart, whatever. So I do think we could be creative and we could make much more use of it, and that's what I think probably Judge Rakoff wrote about even though I haven't read his article. <laughs> Great. So uh, I would like to open up the floor to questions. And they're being, they've been written on cards and will be brought. Uh, we, we have so, a few more minutes. Oh, we do. While they write. You were going to go. I think they got oh, OK. So, so this is the moment at which people can write their questions and hand them to uh, the gentleman who'll be uh, collecting them from you. Well, in that case, I did want to ask uh, one additional question before we open it up to the floor. Uh, and, um, and so one, I want to think about the role of judgment uh, and the fact that judges are human. So in my new role here as Dean for Master's Programs, we have several new programs uh, on data, uh, data science, data analysis and visualization, cognitive neuroscience, which engages artificial intelligence. Uh, but one thing that I think we have not suggested uh, is using artificial intelligence uh, to replace judging. And it's because the fact that we are human 
Uh, the fact that judges are human is actually important uh, to what judges do. Uh, that judges uh, have uh, social roles uh, as perhaps sons, daughters, uh, family members, friends, uh, and, uh, and often judges live in communities. And I guess the question I wanted to ask, particularly along the themes of judicial independence, uh, as what does it mean for a judge to exercise judgment and be human uh, in the context of one's relationship to uh, the communities uh, that one's decisions can affect? Is there an obligation to reta um, retain a certain distance from the social relationships uh, in one's community because of the norm and perception of judicial independence and neutrality? Well, you, you asked a lot of questions at once, and if it's okay <laughs> with the other two, I'd like to take um, this one first. First of all, I do not think judges will be replaced by AI uh, or robots or anything like that. And, and there's a good reason for that, because the word judges means exercise of judgment. And I don't want an algorithm. I don't want an algorithm to tell me who to release on bail. Because there is a human element. There's a judgment call. You listen to somebody. You look at somebody. No algorithm can do that. What algorithms do, which is dangerous, and, and we talk about that in terms of certain biases, such as race or, or, or economic status. The algorithm says, oh, this person may have um, had not held a job for X numbers of years. This person has less education than that person. This person has family members in prison. Suddenly, you use that algorithm to say they shouldn't be released on bail. But that's not maybe right. You have to look at this individual, not a bunch of stats that might describe what categories you can put this in. So I'm against the idea that algorithms can replace judges. They can't. Now, to turn to your other part of your question, no, of course a judge does not cut herself off from her family and her community. And this is my chance to make a pitch about diversity on the bench. It is so important to have judges of all different backgrounds and all different types, gender, race, ethnicity, background, whatever you call it. It's really important that everybody brings a different background to the bench. If we had all one kind of people, that wouldn't reflect the community that we serve. So we do come with our own backgrounds. We bring that to our judging. Of course, we follow the rule of law. But if we all came out with the same decision on every case, then we would be a robot. There is no, there's often not one right answer. That's what judgment means. So we don't cut ourselves off from the community. Now that said, I don't think we consult the community. <laughs> when, when there's a case to be had, you don't talk to your friends and family and say, how do you think I should rule? I, think, <laughs> I, I actually think you alluded to that before. I think it was you, Judge Rivera, when you said something about, we don't take the political temperature uh, out there and respond to that. What's the public opinion polls tell us? We, that's not how we rule. But we are human, as you said. We are aware of our community and our family. And it's, it's something that we bring to, the, to our judging. Oops. Judge Katzman. I, I, uh, I fully agree uh, with everything that, that Judge Schillen said. That's called affirm. Yeah, affirm, <laughs> affirm. Interestingly enough, though, I've heard that there is some uh, research being done as to the use of AI uh, in law. In, yeah. in law. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and for example, in administrative decisions, social security decisions, uh, there's, there's some projects underway as we speak about looking at how the, those kinds of decisions can be made uh, through the use of uh, artificial intelligence. And, uh, I worry about replacing judgment with robots. And I realize that's a very simplistic statement. But that's really what you're going to be getting if you, if you, uh, if you eliminate the human element from, from judging. We come full circle on that other question you asked about income inequality. Uh, it strikes me this is one of those areas where the, the well-heeled will not be looking for <laughs> the latest technology <laughs> um, uh, to the extent that you know, something becomes uh, an algorithm and doesn't really look at the individual behind those numbers. That 
this strikes me as a response to sort of mass justice, whether it's in the administrative law context or some other context. And again, would just rarefy and reflect the, that income inequality, right? The, the ones who are well resourced will always ensure that they are uh, having access to what they see as the best uh, legal opportunity and, and the best legal outcome. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see that as a general matter, judges are gonna be replaced, no, no matter how cute the robot may look, uh, or whatever robe the robot will be wearing. Um, but I, I, I do think that it is true that a more diverse bench is important to democracy. It's important to the confidence that the public has in, in uh, our judicial branch. But it's also true that uh, we are indeed human beings. We bring all of those experiences to bear, and that can be very positive uh, in, the, in the judicial deliberative process. It also means that you have to be, in this sense, using the vernacular of the day, very woke. You have to be aware of where your bias. You have to be aware that, you know, it's one thing to bring in experience and, and uh, to be aware of uh, the way that has influenced you and, and what mark that has made on, on you. But it's also important to be aware how that may influence a decision in a negative way. That it renders you unable to be open to arguments, unable to really fully appreciate the record that's in front of you, unable to really listen to a colleague's alternative arguments and alternative views. And that's where a judge has to be very, very cautious, which is why I do think, at least uh, from my perspective on, on a collegial appellate court, it's really important that we hear one another and that we are different and that we bring that to the table, but that I can go back into my chambers and say, you know, is there something else that's driving my view in this case? Is there something here that I need to check myself on? Because that, that is not what I want to bring to this table. That's sort of the view that's open and, and thinking analytically about this legal question and how, what was the purpose of this statute? What's, what's the intent behind this constitutional provision? What are we trying to further in this democracy uh, that I can, I can add to in the way I think through the problem, as opposed to I only want one outcome, I've only got one agenda, uh, because I see the world through a particular lens and I don't care what anyone else brings to this table. Those are the things that I think we have to be very cautious of. Okay, so um, thank you very much for those who've written questions for the judges. So uh, we'll begin with this one. Are mandatory sentences a challenge to democracy? I don't know if they're a challenge to democracy, but what they caused us to have was the highest prison population in the world. Mandatory sentences filled up prisons in America like no other country. And so, at least on the federal side, we've had some relief from mandatory sentences in terms of what we call the sentencing guidelines. They're no longer mandatory. We still have mandatory sentences in some of our statutes where we have to give a certain sentence and the judge has no choice. And by the way, that was one of the most painful experiences for me as a trial judge, a sentencing judge, that I had to give a sentence a few times that I didn't believe was right. I didn't believe it was right. And my choice was resign or impose it. And I thought about resigning the, very early on, but then I realized it would just be another judge who had to give the same sentence to the same person, so it didn't make any sense to leave because then the, the bench would lose my particular voice, which I thought was a good voice to have on the bench, so, <laughs> so I stayed. But the point is that mandatory sentencing really has this, has this bad effect. Now, in the state system also, at least in New York, there was a period of very draconian sentencing in drug cases. It was called the Rockefeller Drug Laws, and it filled our prisons again. And we moved away from that here in New York too. So our prison population to some extent has been reduced. But I do think, I, I don't know that I'd call it a threat to democracy, but it, it's not, frankly, to put it bluntly, it's not a good thing. We need to trust our judges to figure out an appropriate sentence. And I don't think it should be impro imposed by the political branch. You see, mandatory sentencing 
is, is a statute. So it's passed by the legislative branch. And remember, the legislative branch are politicians. They're elected. So of course, they're answering to their constituency. And if, if they want to be tough on crime and reelected, they're going to pass these mandatory sentencing. So much better to leave it to judges, which is not a political branch, to impose the sentence that's appropriate. Well, you know, I, I, yeah, I think it is a threat to democracy in this sense, and, and you alluded to it. To the extent that uh, mandatory sentences fall harshest and most heavily on particular communities, that's about inequality. That's not about justice. That's not about, you know, if we really want to say, well, if you, if you do the crime, you, you do the time. But if that's fa falling harshest and on particular uh, groups of individuals, if that's resulting in the devastation of whole communities, that means that we as a society are not really fully appreciating that choice, right? And that's just, again, uh, 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 ensuring that inequality uh, will continue because we're not going to be able to have people talk across the aisle and really explain why a mandatory sentence, maybe you think that means we're going to be tough on crime or you think it's going to ensure consistency. You know, you may think that judges having uh, a certain discretion means that someone who goes into courtroom A is going to get five years and someone who goes into courtroom B is going to get 50 and that's unfair. Okay, well that, that's an interesting argument to make. But when we don't, as a society, think through and observe the consequences of what perhaps at one point was well-intentioned, and see that indeed it has fallen heaviest on particular groups, particular communities, uh, then I think it, it does uh, uh, put our democracy at peril. I think one of the, uh, the few bright spots uh, in the last year in Washington was that uh, there seemed to be a consensus that at least we should begin to think about how to re reducing uh, some of these uh, extraordinary disparities. And uh, the law has been changed uh, in some important areas um, to, uh, that will address some of the concerns that both uh, Judge Shinlin and Judge Rivera have, have mentioned. And uh, the fact that you had Republicans and Democrats coming together to realize, yes, there is a problem, that there is a problem which uh, disproportionately affects those who are poor and without resources, and that they actually did something about it, uh, is, is hopeful in terms of the future. So here's an interesting question. Would cameras in the courtroom enable the public to understand what courts do? and increase confidence in the courts, or might it have the opposite effect? We have, we have two appellate judges. I don't think either of you were trial judges. Is that, that's right? Right. Right. So, so the trial courtroom and the appellate courtroom are different. And for example, I know that your court, Judge Rivera, it is live stream. The appellate argument you can watch in New York uh, because there's no witnesses, there's no jury, it's okay. But the trial court is a different kind of court. And the question is whether the cameras would change the dynamic in a sense. Would the witness react differently because he or she knows she's on camera? Would it affect her ability to be candid in her testimony? Would it influence the judge's behavior? Would the judge be sort of speaking for the camera, so to speak, and wanting to appear uh, to have said something clever, for example, and it would affect the behavior? It is true. And then jurors, jurors who don't want their image uh, on every news station every night might lose their anonymity. So while in theory, I do think that uh, cameras in the courtroom gives the public access to the proceedings. I think we have to weigh that question because there are good things about it and not so good things about it at the trial level. Now we do, it's a public courtroom of course, the public has access. So we often have media in the courtroom and the media can, can write every night and explain what happened in the courtroom. And members of the public do come to, to certain trials anyway that they're interested in. As was said in the introduction, on my uh, stop and frisk trial, which was a public trial, the courtroom was jammed every 
day, every day, but with all different kinds of folks who really wanted to watch these proceedings. It meant a lot to them. And so hundreds of people came in and watched. However, I'm not so sure what I think of cameras during all public trials, particularly on the criminal side. It is true that at the Court of Appeals, it is live streamed, it's archived. The briefs are also up. The opinions, of course, are accessible, so you can sort of see from, from that argument from the lawyers on paper, in person, the questions the judges are asking, and then the ultimate decision. And I think that's great uh, for transparency. And frankly, my colleagues and I forget there's a camera. I mean, sometimes you look over and there's a camera, but sometimes we do forget because we are caught up in the arguments, We're, and we have to render a decision. So we can't be about the business spending our time looking at the camera. So in that way, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's very important to transparency and for people to have access. Of course, we are located in Albany, and not everyone can come to our court. So the idea that one can just walk into the court at any time uh, is not is not something that uh, is a, a, a real option from the majority of people, although it is a public courthouse and people can, of course, uh, come. I am concerned, though, uh, although these are all really important issues that have been raised, that it does leave uh, access to whatever organization uh, is able to bring people in. So I very much advocate that it be a requirement in our public school system that every year classes go to the courts. And I know that in the Second Circuit there's this wonderful uh, educational uh, uh, room that now has been set up that's uh, phenomenal and kids are going to learn a great deal from that and we're trying to do similar things of course in New York. But it is uh, a way to deal with that lack of information. So yes, you don't necessarily have to uh, have televised every trial, uh, but if our communities have been exposed to trials, what real trials are, not what they see on Law and Order or whatever else is on TV, uh, you know, where everything's resolved in 48 minutes with commercials, uh, <laughs> or without commercials. Uh, that's really what people need to understand, and then they can make their own choices about, you know, I, I have a free day, maybe I'll go to a court, or maybe I know about a trial, or find out where there may be some trials, when there's an oral argument, and go in. Uh, and so I do encourage all of you who are uh, not regularly in a courtroom to, uh, to go and observe uh, judges as well as lawyers uh, doing the business of ensuring that justice gets done in the courtroom. Serve on a jury, yes, absolutely. Although there are fewer and fewer juries, but yes, there is always a great need for uh, jurors. So Judge Katzman, uh, I know the question was about cameras, but if you'd like to say a few words about civics education in the context of your court. We, um, uh, we have an active program called Justice uh, for All Courts in the Community, and the idea is to bring courts closer to the communities uh, we serve and for us to better understand the communities that we serve. And so um, we have a, uh, uh, an active, uh, we have a learning center, the whole fifth floor of the uh, courthouse at uh, 40 Foley Square, Thurgood Marshall Courthouse is, uh, is essentially a living learning center. And uh, you can, for example, uh, your classes can, can come uh, we have instructions, we've got library labs, um, so you can learn how to sue your teachers and your parents, just, just, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we, we've got uh, kiosks so that, uh, for example, you can listen to Thurgood Marshall argue the, the case of Cooper v. Aaron, and for a student or, or for a citizen to be able to hear that is, is truly uh, inspiring. Uh, we have a create space that our library has uh, created where students can create podcasts. Um, we have regular series of lunches uh, with judges uh, and moot courts. So, um, uh, you, you know, this is something that as, as chief judge I've, I've really tried to um, uh, promote and uh, it's uh, the, the the philosopher John Dewey said that um, democracy has to be born anew every generation with education 
as its midwife. And that, I think, uh, is something that we all on this stage would agree with. So we hear nearly every day that the US is on the verge of a constitutional crisis. What exactly does that mean, and how real is the risk? They can't answer that because either one of them, either one of them may get a case that raises some of these issues. So I really do think I'm the only one who can up here, up here, of course, who can respond to that question. What a constitutional crisis would mean to me is that there's a clash between the co-equal branches, something I described earlier. And we are living with it right now as we're seeing the sort of the war between the legislative branch, branch and the executive branch. The legislative branch has oversight power. It's in the Constitution. They're doing a constitutional job when they investigate, when they subpoena certain records, when they call people to testify, that's their right. But if the executive branch says, no way, we're, we're gonna ignore your subpoenas, we're not gonna respond to them, we're not gonna show up, that creates a constitutional conflict because one branch is not respecting another branch. And so where's that conflict gonna go? to the third branch, which is what the judiciary is called, the third branch. So these issues will end up in the courts, and because of our system, the courts will have the last word on this. Now, there is precedent on some of these issues. For example, not responding to a subpoena was with the third article of impeachment against President Nixon. So, you, you know, we know that the executive has to respond to subpoenas because no one's above the law. But right now, we are on the verge of that particular constitutional crisis. I'm sure there are others that I, that I could think of if I had hours to do it, but that's the one that comes to mind because it's, to, it's today, it's right now. They can't comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. We want, we want you free to be the judge on anything that comes up. Okay. So, um, he, some commentators say that Justice Kavanaugh's appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court signaled a new level of politicization. Is that true? Was this confirmation really a break from the past? This ties into our earlier discussion, of course. Probably not. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I consulted with my, at least one of my colleagues and yeah. I was told, go for it. <laughs> I was told to go for it. So, well, it's, it was very political, but it was certainly not unprecedented. We have had previous confirmation hearings that were extremely contentious. Some of you might recall uh, Judge Bork when he was nominated to the Supreme Court and what happened during that confirmation process probably set the stage for the next 50 years. It's, it's not the first time in our history that we've had what you might call a political problem in terms of the appointments to the highest court. Uh, you might remember the uh, Roosevelt court, prac court packing history event. Some of you who are historians will remember that that was a very conservative court when, when President Franklin Roosevelt became president. And he, he wasn't happy because that court kept striking down the New Deal initiatives. So he just said, well, there's an easy way around it. We'll just have a larger Supreme Court and I'll appoint all the new justices. But believe it or not, both parties said, no, you're wrong, that's not our system. You'll, you'll get your turn when there's a vacancy. And sure enough, slowly over time, the court shifted with his appointments and the New Deal initiatives went through. So it's not unprecedented, but I will say that the rancor this time was probably the worst I had seen in a confirmation hearing since Justice Thomas's hearing and then before that, just a Judge Bork's hearing. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not all that new, but it was, it was what, what surprised me about it, I guess, was how involved the public became. The public was riveted, maybe because of social media, maybe because of television coverage, but we were all uh, hanging on every word, so to speak, throughout that process. And as you know, the vote was extremely close, going back to what we said before about the 51-49 or 52-48 votes that we've seen in so many confirmations. So it wasn't our, our let's say, our brightest moment. Well, 
Uh, that brings us to the end of our program, and I want to thank all three of you uh, for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us this evening and to talk uh, honestly about some very important issues with regard to the role of judges in democracy. Thank you.